Jesus' name, amen. If you don't mind, I'm going to have to have a cough drop. I apologize in advance. I don't think um, don't think we'll make it without it, though. So we'll just have to get around it, okay? And we'll make it happen. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 17. Today we're focused on the concept of the day of God's wrath. It is a term used throughout Scripture to describe the ultimate end when God will execute His final judgment on the dominating force of sin and evil in this world and on all those who have rejected and forsaken Him. This is not a general term. Wrath can be interpreted uh, variously and applied in lots of different ways. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the specific and well-described uh, scriptural event called the day of God's wrath. It is in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and it is aimed at these last days as described in the book of Revelation and these specific events. So chapter 6, verse 12, uh, this is the sixth seal of the seven seals that we've been studying. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to earth as a fig drops from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. <clears throat> they called to the mountains and the rocks, <coughs> fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? The day of their wrath. Um, it's not uh, capitalized here, but as a proper name of a specific event, it could be capitalized everywhere you see it in Scripture. We have covered the first five seals opened from the scroll that is in the hand of Christ in chapter 5. Most likely, those five represent the arrival first of the Antichrist. He comes on the scene at the beginning of that seven-year period known as the tribulation or the general tribulation. Um, and as he takes his rise, um, those events start to uh, open up in front of us. So we're going to finish chapter 6 today uh, before we take probably several weeks to focus on Christmas and the new year, we'll pick back up on, uh, I assume, January the 7th at this point. Um, clearly, Revelation 6 portrays the first half of the tribulation as a time of increasing catastrophe. I believe that catastrophe is going to be a good uh, description of what it takes for us even to get to seal number one. Lots of bad things have to happen for lots of people to cry out for Satan himself to come and be the savior of the world. So terrible things are going to happen in the world to make people that desperate. And then imagine how bad it will be once he actually is going to take over. Um, all of those things are kind of a precondition before these events take place. And in fact, um, <clears throat> during those difficult times, even uh, pre-tribulation and the first five seals, it's going to be pretty calamitous, but it is not God specifically applying his judgment. During that time, that's not the day of God's wrath. The day of God's wrath looks something even more um, specifically painful, horrifying, terrifying than even what's going to happen to get us to the point of the day of God's wrath. 
when the Antichrist steps on the scene, Second Thessalonians tells us specifically, he will not come to his place until he who restrains him is removed. That is a specific reference to the presence of the Holy Spirit on this world doing the work that the Holy Spirit is doing. The fact is that most people on the world don't realize the only thing that keeps this planet spinning on its axis and rotating as it's supposed to and the sun rising and setting and people able to wake up every morning and hearts beating and mouths functioning. The only thing that makes this world go is the presence of the Spirit of God. That is expressed again and again in Scripture, that God is sustaining His world, that He's advancing His world. So He is present and at work. But when the Holy Spirit is given reign and control, the Spirit of God steps back out of the picture. He withdraws Himself. And so in these first five seals, we can't imagine what life on this planet is like without God doing what God does in our lives and in our environment every single day. So the Lord removes his restraint. He withdraws his guiding hand over the affairs of this world. That does not mean, though, that he has permanently abandoned his creation. He doesn't go off on vacation or give up on anything. Uh, it does not mean that he is uninvolved. Uh, it is all part of the total plan. Antichrist takes over, the Spirit of God withdraws, and he thought he knew what he was doing. Antichrist, he does not know what he's doing. He cannot do what the Lord has done. So quickly, things will fall apart. I want to do a lot around the word timeline today because there's so much, I guess, just longing for us to be able to put this down on a piece of paper and lay out this exact timeline of every event and give specifics to when everything is going to happen. So we're going to talk about the timeline perspective, uh, but you'll, you'll see quite quickly, and you probably have already come to understand this, it's very hard to put a timeline on these events, on the book of Revelation at all. <clears throat> but <laughs> there are some specific things that we can say and some specific events that we can line up in the right order. But there are plenty of others that we cannot, and we just have to accept Maybe we don't quite get all the details there. Maybe we don't understand. Maybe the Lord is going to reveal that in its time as it needs to be revealed. Uh, so we get timeline identifiers, timeline um, declarations, timelines being expressed. If you've ever seen the end times charts, I hope you didn't pay too much money for those. But if you ever ordered one of those inline charts and you roll it out on the table and it's got these 327 things just exactly lined up about what it's going to be and how it's going to happen and when it's going to happen, um, you're wasting your time and your money if you bought one of those. Okay, there are, again, very specific events, um, but we're not told the winds and the hows for a reason. Our job is to trust in the Lord and be faithful. And so what we can know, God's given to that to us very specifically. What we can cannot know, we're supposed to be able to say, it's okay. I don't have to know all those details. I'm going to trust the Lord. For instance, just as a, as a general kind of umbrella statement, we don't know the date of any of these things. The when and the wherefore. And in fact, <clears throat> as we look at the conditions of the world today, and we say, hey, it sure looks like the Lord can come any day now. I'm going to tell you something. They were saying that 100 years ago. They were saying that 300 years ago. They were saying that 1,000 years ago. They were saying that 1,500 years ago. So there have been conditions, times in the world, where it looked like everything was falling apart, and there was a horrible despotic uh, leader killing lots of people, <clears throat> Christians suffering tremendously, and it would be easy to say, oh yeah, that's got to be it. But it wasn't it. 
So we're looking at it. We're thinking this way. It's legitimate for us to think this way. The Bible says to look for the signs, to assess the conditions, to prepare yourself, to be ready, to long for his coming. But at the same time, we have to be very careful that we don't go from the certainty of what we know and, and start m melding into very confusing, um, cloudy uh, distractions that will actually cause real difficulties. Churches have actually split over the issues that the Bible's not really specific about. People fight over the silliest things. Well, I believe this. Well, you know, I believe that. Well, the Bible doesn't really say which one of those it is. And we'll go to war over those things. Isn't that kind of silly? Not just kind of silly. It's dumb. And Satan wins the battle in that case. What we are told is what to look for. We're told to get ready, and we're told to stand solid in the kingdom. And those are the things that we would fight about, that we'd be sure and certain and fixed on. So there's a lot of questioning. There's a lot of debate. Um, but there are some clear sequences that we can get in order. The fifth seal last Sunday introduced us to the martyrs who were around the altar crying out for vindication. And it says in Revelation 6, 11, they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were killed as they had been was complete. So there's an exact number of individuals who are going to be martyred for the faith and that number is very specific in the Lord's mind. And when that number is reached, that is the turning point. It is a clear timeline. This is a fixed number of martyrs. God has this laid out clearly when this process is going to change gears entirely. When the last martyr enters through the gate the great klaxon bell of the kingdom will sound i don't know what that bell is going to sound like i don't know if it's a trumpet the bible talks about lots of trumpet sounds in heaven maybe it will be maybe it will be the the, the what's the submarine dive Ooga, you know or ding 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 or i don't know if you're in arkansas Sue or whatever it's going to be it's going to be loud bold clear and determined and it will sound and everybody will know. I think even the martyrs who are crying out how long are going to r loudly respond in cheer and affirmation. They're going to know it's time. The time has come. The end is here. Everything is going to be set right. They will no longer say how long. They're going to say it is here. Antichrist sits on the world's throne, but the Lord's day of wrath has come. I would imagine if there really was a klaxon bell or a trumpet, even the Antichrist and the demon horde will hear it and know what it means. I can imagine that very clearly. They will hear it. They will tremble when they hear the sound. Romans uh, 2 verse 5 says, Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. You think God doesn't know? You think you can get away with that secret sin? You think you can keep on playing and pretending I go to church? Um, I, those people don't know I don't really believe that stuff. You're storing up wrath for yourself. If you are not a follower of Jesus, you're not going to skate in. You're not going to sneak in. You're not going to find the climb under the fence, the back entrance. I heard one person joke about, I'm going to uh, make my way into heaven singed in my hair on fire. No, you're not. Like I've been to hell and uh, fortunately I got to enjoy all of that. That shows how ridiculous that person is. And think I'm going to sneak into heaven. If you don't know Jesus, you are in the wrath column and it is being accumulated and someday it will be expressed. All of these people all over the world live their lives to themselves and to their sin. They are stubborn and unrepentant. Wrath is the final result and it is much deserved. So the last martyr shows up at the altar and then seal number six opens under the first five the earth is dominated by the general ravages of sin and evil that is free to do as evil seeks to do to control and consume 
all across creation. But then things go from sin's dominating force to the full brunt of the day of God's wrath. It is a drastic, specific, clear, obvious change of tone, change of intensity, change of, of purpose and drive behind it. And the Antichrist knows, okay, my time is coming to an end. He knows there's no way I'm going to be able to resist this. And still he sees with the rage and the anger and the resistance to the hand of God. The seal is open. And we come to this point. So I want to talk about now uh, another timeline issue uh, that everybody seems to have an opinion on. And most of the time, the opinion goes to opinion rather than specific verse. Can you show me specifically the verse that says that exactly the way you believe it? Of course, I'm talking about the rapture. I'm not going to spend a whole sermon at any one point, that, but there will be numerous places in the book of Revelation where we can discuss the rapture and, and grow to understand it as best as we can. Uh, we know the rapture is a serious timeline kind of issue, but it is much more difficult to be precise in timing the rapture as most people actually would believe. We've been told one thing most of our lives in our history as Southern Baptists, and we've come to believe one specific thing uh, based more on the words of some preacher than actually on what the Bible says about the subject. So I'm not trying to undermine any faith, anybody's faith. I'm not trying to turn it upside down. I, I just want to broaden your understanding because where our truth comes from is God's Word, right? Not some preacher somewhere. Especially if they're on one of those TV ministries where they're always telling you how much money they need you to send for their product. That, that, that's a warning sign right there. So we need to know what the Bible says and then we can work on our interpretations and opinions and decide how we're going to think about it. But at the same time, the difference between clear truth in Scripture versus opinion, human ideas. Uh, ultimately, you can't really find the verse that says it exactly how you believe it. No matter which perspective <clears throat> you might believe about the rapture, there's nowhere in Scripture that tells you exactly when the rapture is going to happen. And there is confusion about what it actually looks like because of that reason. So we need to say, here's where the Bible goes, here's where my faith is going to go, and my certainty but I do get it. Believers uh, that are still alive during this time are not asking how long until God's wrath falls like the martyrs around the altar. Believers who are still alive are asking how long until I can go home. I don't want to be a part of this. This is not going to be fun. And certainly the motivation is clear why we want to get out of here as quickly as we can. I am convinced, however, that the question uh, for most is based more on personal interest than it is on God's perfect will or on our purpose to bear fruit in whatever situation we find ourselves. Now, I understand this. I have the same kind of feelings. Uh, I'm not sure there's any Christian who would say, the day of God's wrath? Oh, yeah, I can't wait for that. I'm going to get a chair right in the middle of that. N no, that's not how we think. So I get it. I understand. I'm going to give you just some of the, the most basic um, flavoring, the most basic kind of perspective on three primary rapture positions. Um, there is the pre-trib, pre-tribulation rapture. There is, uh, I call it pre-wrath, which would be right now before this seal is open. Some call that mid-trib, mid-tribulation. And then there is the post trib rapture uh, the tribulation seven years the beginning of the seven years most likely seal number one when the conqueror comes on the scene so a pre-trib rapture would happen before that actually takes place a pre-wrath or mid would be right now where we are in the text in revelation 6 post-trib would be all the way in revelation 19 where jesus comes back to conquer uh, the armies of the enemy and uh, gain his uh, authority and his position. 
So let's talk about pre-trib rapture. The idea of the pre-trib rapture has only been around since 1827. It cannot be found in any writings, in any kind of theological um, evaluations before about 200 years ago. One man um, felt led of the Lord and began proclaiming this interpretation of Scripture. And then it was picked up and expanded. I understand entirely why. Because this would be the favorable interpretation. This would be what we would all desire. Uh, before that, for 1800 years, the church only taught post-trib rapture. For 1800 years. So the pre-trib rapture actually declares there has to be two second comings. That, that's a catch for some people. Because the Bible never says anything about this is coming number one, this is coming number two. It does talk about the instances. The question is, are they the same or are they two different kinds of events? Pre-trib rapture would require there to be two second comings. You know this. I know you've heard it before. First, Christ comes for his saints. That's the rapture. And then Christ comes with his saints. That's Revelation 7, 19, the final battle. The greatest difficulty, um, just to be completely honest, wouldn't you love to have a pastor who's trying to be honest in the pulpit? Um, but just to be entirely honest, the greatest difficulty is it is pure conjecture. It's based on opinion. There's not enough strength of evidence in Scripture for you to say, I'm absolutely certain that this is how it's going to work. So that becomes a real challenge for us. <clears throat> There's nowhere you see anything about the second coming. In the book of Revelation, there are not two comings that are mentioned. That doesn't mean that there are not two comings. Because we can say at the same time, while we can't find specifically that in Scripture, we also cannot find specifically anything against that. Either way, though, I'm filling in blanks and trying to um, fix this in my opinion and my understanding. Then the pre-wrath rapture, mid-trib. Uh, this is based on the fact that God's Word puts overwhelming emphasis on the need for Christians to endure hard times, to stand firm, to be faithful. You will be persecuted, is what the Bible says, to all Christians everywhere forever. We're re repeatedly told this. We're even called to be ready to die for the cause of Christ. We don't preach those sermons very much anymore, but it is again and again expressed in the New Testament. As well, millions of Christians are around the altar in heaven now who have already been martyred for the faith, crying out for their vindication. Why would we expect God to decide that us last generation Christians are so special that we would never have to go through the tribulation. That's really what that is. God has allowed Christians for now 2,000 years to suffer horrible abuses and death and deprivation. Horrible things. But one of the things I hear said about a pre-trib rapture is, oh, God would never allow that to happen to Christians. Well, he's allowed it for our whole existence. Why would it be different now? Why would we think anything different? The difference at seal number six is that now begins the outpouring of God's wrath. And it is clear uh, and well understood uh, and easily supported that no Christian will be intentionally harmed from the Father's own hand. In fact, in chapter 7, God's going to put a seal, a protection on all Christians who are still alive and present during the rest of this time. Uh, who those are, we'll talk about some more to try and understand. Um, if there's a pre-trib rapture, this is a different group of Christians than those who were raptured. If there's a pre-wrath rapture, then this in chapter 7 is a different group of Christians than the ones who were raptured um, in chapter 6. Uh, but we do know wrath of God, that's not for believers. We might suffer at the hands of this world. We might suffer at the hands of the enemy. We might suffer from demonic oppression. We might suffer from our sin nature that is at us and against us all the time. But you will never suffer at the hand of God. 
That does not work that way. So mid-trib rapture would happen before God pours out his wrath. Of course, that still means Christians will live uh, in the first three and a half years, seals number one through five, when things are pretty bad. And Christians will live in the preliminary time working up to that point. Uh, it still would mean there would have to be two second comings. The rapture at the pre-wrath point, and then in Revelation 19, the final arrival when the Lord comes for the final victory. Uh, and we do know from chapter 7 and some other places, chapter 13, there will be Christians present during the Great Tribulation, the second three and a half year time period. Um, so there's a lot here. I don't want this to sound like a lecture, okay? I hope you're not going to sleep on me already. I taught the youth Sunday school class this morning, so energy is what we need. We need, we need to stay plugged in. I, I want to preach, but there's lots of information uh, that really needs to be clearly understood. So a lot of teaching here this morning. Number three is the post-trib rapture, the post trib rapture. This has been the historic doctrine of the church for most of our history, uh, and it is, I don't want to unsettle you too much, it is the approach that best aligns with the clearest and most literal interpretation of the various passages. We say we believe God's Word is literal, and it's meant to be taken literal in every place that it can. If it's not poetry, if it's not symbolism like a lot of revelation turns out to be, um, the first step of interpreting the Bible is, what does this literally say, and what does it mean specifically understood that way? So if you take all the passages about the return of Christ and look at the terminology and the specifics of those passages, then we tend to fall down in the category of a post-trib rapture. Now, I realize the majority of Southern Baptists are not post-trib rapture people. And I am not telling you I am a post-trib rapture person. Um, when I interviewed to become your pastor, I mean the question and answer thing we did, um, I actually had one of you, I don't remember who it was, it was a lady, come up to me afterwards and say, what, what about the rapture, are you pre-trib? And I have to tell you, I don't know. I don't know because I'm trying to be accurate and clear with everything the Bible says, and I think if the Bible doesn't tell us, the Lord doesn't really want us to know. Is that, is that okay for me to say that? I want to know what God's Word says, and I'm going to go as far as it goes, and where it stops, I'm going to stop. And so I have desires. I want it to be pre-trib. I don't want it to be post-trib. But what I want it to be is what God wants it to be. And I have to be confident to trust Him for that. I do think there are lots of excesses, lots of extremes in the teachings of these subjects. I'm not telling you you have to be a this or you have to be a that. Um, but at the same time, all I can do is tell you what God's Word says. Um, I have time and time again sat in a congregation and listened to some arrogant old cocky preacher tell you what he knows. And I'm thinking, you don't know that. That's not in the Bible. When did you elevate yourself to the point where you are now the voice of revelation? That's what some of those other denominations do. But denominations who believe the Bible is literal and accurate and fulfilled, we don't do that. I heard a preacher preach through the book of Revelation. Uh, I probably told you this before. And every Sunday he'd go, this is going to happen and this horrible thing. And you got to see this and how this is going to be. But then he would say, but you don't have to worry about that. Y'all won't be here anyway. I'm like, why are we even preaching through this book? If we don't need to know it and it doesn't matter in our lives, why would this book be in the Bible? Why would it be the last book of the Bible? Maybe God's got something to say to us in the book of Revelation. There's no way you can preach anything in God's word and say, this doesn't matter. I was horrified to hear him say it. And I was almost at the point of getting up and walking out. So I want you to understand my passion is for what does God's word say? And that's what I can stand on. That's what I can teach you. That's what I can believe in. That's what I will die for. 
And I hope that is your same conviction. Let's move on. The timeline then is specifically here about the day of the Lord, the day of the wrath of God. And that does not affect your interpretation of the rapture at all. Most importantly, seal number six is the actual arrival of this event when it comes in this timeline, uh, when the terrible judgments of God are administered on the earth. So the description here is a general tone. It's only meant to tell you the day has arrived, but it's not a 24-hour day. We have seven trumpet judgments and seven bowls of God's wrath. That gets us all the way up to Revelation 16. Ten chapters. The day of God's wrath, uh, seal number six, is actually telling us that what's coming next. And interestingly, when we get to trumpet number seven, trumpet number seven is actually the next seven bowls of God's wrath. So we go through these groupings of seven, and the last one points you to the next grouping that is about to come. That is all part of the wrath of God, and they are the events that will be experienced over the next three and a half years. Uh, verses 12 through 17 express that seal number six is a great earthquake, and, and write this down, great calamity, great earthquake and great calamity. The earthquake is the initiation point. Now, there are a lot of questions because earthquakes show up again uh, ahead of us. And stars falling from the sky show up again. Other events that sound similar to this. So you get the idea of overview, summary, but you also get the idea of something, I believe, that starts it off. I think there will be a specific um, beginning great earthquake. And when that earthquake happens, it's like everything changes. You ever read anything about the, the polar points, um, the North Pole, the South Pole reversing or moving or read anything uh, about when the continents were aligned a certain way and something happened and whole continents split apart? So listen to the language here again in verse 12. The sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. The stars in the sky fell to earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Um, that is massive natural disaster, massive cataclysm, worldwide earthquake that affects everything. Jesus mentions the same events, Matthew 24. Um, in the Gospels, there's generally a chapter. It's the same um, teaching, but uh, expressed by uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what Jesus said about end times events. So really, the chapter summarizes the whole book of Revelation and some of the teaching in Daniel, First and Second Thessalonians, uh, places like that. But Jesus gives us a chapter, and he um, specifically talks about some of these events. One of them is what we're uh, addressing here. Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the distress of those days. That's the first three and a half years he's talking about. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. And the heavenly bodies will be shaken. What's amazing is Jesus is actually quoting here from Isaiah 13. This is clear teaching that's been expressed, Isaiah 13, repeatedly by Jesus, and now again in Revelation 6. Jesus also says, the beginning of this, verse 21, there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world, and never to be equaled again. These are going to be events like nothing anybody has ever been through before. So seal number six is a summary of, of the rest of the book of Revelation. These few verses, it's going to be bad, 
Really, really, really bad. More and worse than anything you have ever read about, than anything you've imagined. It's going to be worse than any disaster movie has ever even come up with to try and depict the worst kind of situations and environments you can imagine. Uh, this world has seen calamity and disaster and evil and horror and distress, but these events will be vastly beyond that. We've seen evil on October the 7th in Israel and what the Hamas terrorists did to 1,400 innocent Israeli civilians. The full brutal force of evil. They even videotaped it, which is evil upon evil. I'm going to delight in the horrors of my evil and celebrate it. And we know what evil produces in the natural order of our world. In 2010, January, Haiti experienced an earthquake, just the island of Haiti, that killed 316,000 people. It's believed to be the second most deadly earthquake in all of human history. Uh, surprisingly, our planet experiences 55 earthquakes every day. You remember Jesus talking about birth pains? It's just gearing itself up. It's just getting ready. We got to keep all of the, the mechanism prepared and loosened up and ready for when this day arrives. And so when it does, the numbers and the memories and the news reports won't matter anymore. There will be no comparison. There will be no understanding. There will be no human explanation for everything that happens. They try to report the news about what happened in Israel, and you know the shock. You and I, we are shocked about what happened on October the 7th, and you see them sitting there shaking their head, and they formulate words to try and explain how they might think these horrible things could happen. When we get to this stage, nobody's going to say anything. They're not going to stand there and make excuses. They're not going to say, well, global warming. They won't talk about global warming anymore. They won't say anything because they know how dumb they will sound. The earthquake shakes everything. I don't have enough time to explain all the details. I wish we could spend so much more time at this. Go watch a YouTube documentary about the Yellowstone Caldera. And watch them tell you what would happen, not if, but when Yellowstone erupts again. It will change the whole world. The ash cloud will go around the whole world, which is likely what is the sun blackened and the moon turned to red. That's often the way that's interpreted. This massive earthquake affects everything. The cloud surrounds the whole world. The stars fall to the earth, which is probably not real stars, full on stars. We know they, they would obliterate the earth. That would be an instant end to everything, uh, but probably asteroids, um, comets, meteors, uh, striking the earth like machine gun fashion. I've got a peach tree in my backyard, and we had a storm when the peaches were half formed just this past um, summer, and that tree started rattling, and it was <laughs> all of a sudden, no peaches. They're all on the ground just like that. That's what's being described here in this passage. Uh, and then the sky is split apart. Some atmosphere e affecting event. We're told a couple of times where the clouds, uh, the sky, not just the clouds, but the actual atmosphere peels open. It's laid back. Um, what that is exactly, we don't know, but it's going to happen. Mountains and valleys sliding and moving Whole mountains moving from one place to the other. Who knows the continents sliding around on their tectonic plates. Uh, so the timeline is this is coming at this point. When the last martyr walks through the gate. And God says ring the bell. It's time. It's time. One more timeline um, concept to talk about. And that is the demolishing of timelines pick up in verse 15 the kings of the earth the princes the generals the rich the mighty everyone else slave and free hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains they called to the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb 
For the great day of their wrath has come. Who can withstand it? This is the point where all the people who have denied, disavowed, rejected, hated, mocked, ridiculed, despised the God of the universe. All the people who have said, you Christians are ridiculous. I don't want to be a Christian. You Christians are weak. You Christians are foolish. You Christians are old-fashioned and out of touch. Hate mongers, bigots, homophobes, transphobes, what, what, racists, whatever name they've thrown at the people who name the name of God. All of those people who have despised the God of the universe will come to a new understanding. They will face the reality of what all this means and who they are and what their lives have been about. Some, they have spent their lives thinking spiritual pursuits are silly. Christians are fools of the worst kind. Some reject the idea of God because ultimately they can't accept they, they aren't in control. Others are so filled with pride that they despise humility and servanthood, which is the only mark of a true Christian. And then there are those who reject because they want it all to make sense. Prove it. Make it clear and obvious when we know that human logic can't get you to Jesus. It doesn't work that way. Then there are those that Jesus describes in John 8. You are unable to hear what I say. <coughs> You belong to your father, the devil. That's all the people who do not know Jesus as their savior. They are either under the headship and the fatherhood of God, or they are under the fatherhood of the devil. You belong to your father, the devil. You want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. There is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. He is a liar and the father of lies. The Bible says that initially, all these people will seek to escape God's wrath. They will know the point has arrived. And these silly people have already invested in islands and bunkers and retreats. They know something bad is coming. You can Google this and find um, news article after news article of people who bought this island or bought this place, this mountain, and they've dug their bunker under the mountain and they've installed an airstrip and they put up all their safety apparatus to keep the, the average folks out, the deplorables, I believe we were called. And these people have put all their money into doing everything they can because they think they're in charge. They think they can control their lives. They think money will buy anything and they've got a plan. This is the elites the, the World uh, Economic Forum types, the Davos crowd, the Soroses and the Gateses and the Zuckerbergses and et cetera and et cetera. All the high and mighty. And the passage even names them. The princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty who have done everything they can. Isn't it interesting that as the Spirit tries even to work in their lives to make it plain to them, hey, danger ahead. They see the danger. They already know something's not right in this world. Something's coming. And they put all of their energy into earthly answers, earthly solutions to fix all of this. They think they have the plan, but they are mistaken. Incidentally, their plan to escape, it doesn't include you. All they're saving is them and theirs. Probably have piles of gold. They know cash is going to be worthless then. Or jewels or um, guns and ammunition or whatever. What's the, the prepper slogan is beans, bullets, and band-aids. Now they've uh, maximized that with giant bunkers of all that they think they're going to need to actually survive this. What they don't realize is they don't stand a chance. Any one of them, they do not stand a chance. It says all of them, everyone else, all of the high and mighty, everyone else down to the level of the slave. They hid in the caves and among the rocks and the mountains. But then it gives us a little secret here about what they're really doing when they get there. They call for the rocks to crush them. 
Doesn't sound like that bunker's working out the way they intended, does it? Doesn't sound like it's quite what they expected. No matter what they put in place, they're on their luxury island only realizing the tsunami's right out there. And it's about to sweep that entire island clean. Or they're in their top secret bunker, only have the earth open up and swallow them. That's in the scripture. It has happened before. Or they're in their hideout in the mountains and they can't breathe. There's no oxygen left and things are moving and shaking and rattling and they cannot sleep at night. And it is so bad they want to get it over with. What I think is really kind of hidden parenthetically here is they cannot even kill themselves. This is the beginning of the day of God's wrath. They don't get out that easy. There's more to come. And it's not time. And they cry out for the end. Can we just get this over with? I'm ready to die. And God says, not yet. Not yet you're not. The time for you has not arrived. You remember all that wrath they stored up? All the wrath has not been extended. So let's talk about just some final um, things that, that summarize this pretty well, I think. Things we need to understand are what does this all mean? It means that no one will be able to deny that the future of the earth is out of their control. I wish people could realize that now. They blame global warming on people. Like people can change the weather. They've been trying to change the weather for the last 50 or 75 years. Seems to be going the same as it always has to me. People at this point will realize they are not in control anymore. And they'll realize that God is not happy with the way things have transpired. And that is putting it mildly. That's almost a funny, funny joke. Like, hey man, God is really, really, really not happy. They will learn that the Antichrist is not God and he is not fit to worship they put him in that place they bowed down to him and declared him to be God that's coming in Revelation 13 but it has already happened at this point and yet they now know God is not fit to worship and then uh, verse 17 number four on my note page who can stand that's what they've learned who can stand they come to realize God is exactly who he says he is God's wrath is overwhelming. God will destroy what he says um, that he's going to destroy and that deserves to be destroyed. All of this is the extension of the wrath of God. The um, confusions we have today in the gospel cause a lot of churches to talk about love, but almost never talk about what we're talking about. They won't talk about the fact that God sees your sin, that God knows the deepest secrets of your heart, that God is a holy, just, and righteous God. And if you name yourself as a part of his family, a follower, he has a right to expect that of you as well. And so he is a God who judges sin. Zephaniah chapter 2 has the same thing as what we see here in uh, chapter 6 of Revelation. But I think it gives us a little broader sense of it. Gather together, gather together, O oh, shameful nation, before the appointed time arrives, and that day sweeps on like chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, and you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps, perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's wrath. This is a strong and direct and clear reminder. I think it is uh, one that's necessary and important for us to hear. Maybe God gave me the gravelly voice today so it could add to the intensity of what this is all about. I'm going to wind up talking like a real preacher here before, before we're over. God's trying to get something across to us. He wants you to settle it in your heart. Jesus is everything to me. He's all I need, and I will give everything for him. Is that where you are as a Christian? That's the only place you can be as a Christian. You can't wobble around. 
You can't decide one day I'm going to be sold out and a few more days I'm just going to have fun and do whatever I want to do. God's storing up wrath for this world. Wrath for all the sin and all the evil that's around us. Make sure that your faithfulness is real. Make sure that you are completely dedicated and sold out for Him. Make sure that you are ready for what's coming. Let's pray. Father, you be praised. Be glorified here. We know that you are holy and righteous. We need to confess our sins to you because so many times we are not. We are not holy. We're not righteous. Please forgive us. Cleanse us. Save us. And make us right. I pray, Lord, that what we've talked about, I pray that um, as it is in, in fitting with your word and your will, you would undergird it. You would solidify it in our minds and hearts. I pray, Lord, whatever's frivolous, unnecessary, whatever is lending to confusion, if that's the case, remove it. Just bought it out and give us the right focus and the right commitment for you. We know your word is true. It's real. Give us a heart that's so sold out, dedicated to you. We ask in Jesus' name. I want you to keep your heads bowed. We're just going to remain seated. Please talk to the Lord. Tell him you are ready. Tell him your focus is right. You love him more than anything. Ask him to help you to stay true and faithful. Tell him you know somebody who needs the gospel. And you're going to commit to make that known in their lives. If you need to come speak with me, please come. If you want to know how to be saved, let it be today. Come, let's talk about that. Thank you. Don't forget, 6 o'clock is our uh, evening service. The choir's doing their Christmas program. The kids and our youth will be in here with us. I think they're still going at 5, though. Is that? I know the youth said they're going at 5 with their meal. Is that true of kids? Does anybody know? Katie's not in here. I heard a yes. Okay. Thank you. So the meals are still on for kids and youth. 6 o'clock in here. Please come be part of this tonight. I think you'll be blessed by it, uh, and it'll be a joy for you to be here. Let's stand together. Charles McCorkle, brother, would you close us in prayer this morning?